It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Happy October, everybody. We are here today to kick off October and have a special guest join us from Indian Wells, California. Yes, our special guest is Dr. Matilda Parente. She is an MD and a CSW, and we are so happy to have her joining our show today. Welcome, Matilda. Thank you. Thank you both. Happy to be here. We're really excited about this episode and we have a lot of questions for you. But for those of you that have not met her or have read her works or have been in any of her lectures, she is board certified in pathology and integrative holistic medicine. And she's also a healthcare consultant and medical editor. So Dr. Parente is a member of the Renaud Society and a wine judge for the society's wine competitions and she writes on wine for online and print media and is the author of resveratrol and healing ways an integrative health source book after five years as a wine director at a culinary school the avowed winologist continues to share wine smarts with corporate community and private groups and her keynote and speaking engagements have included the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women campaign, the Society of Wine Educators National Conferences, Merrill Lynch, the American Business Women's Association, and Marriott International. Matilda blogs and tweets about local finds, wine travel, and all things Venice, and that is why you are all here with us today. So that's pretty exciting. You do a lot. I sure do. Wow. <laughs> and we, well, you know what? We're going to talk next about what's in our glasses. I want to start with you because you have something that something special that you want to open later. And then Steph and I will kind of bring up the rear with what we've got. Sure. Well, I'm thinking about my Cerasuolo d'Abruzzo, which is a special kind of Italian rosé. I call them meaty rosés. They're done by the Sagne method rather than a direct press. So they tend to be darker, bolder, and bigger in body. And they go with a lot more foods than typical like Provencal style rosés do. So I'm going to have that with a meat pasta. It's sort of a twist that I do on Bolognese pasta where I use Chinese five spice so it comes out with a really intriguing depth of flavor and it calls for a bolder wine but not really a red i think the cheddar swallow will be just perfect wow do you have the recipe for that or do you just kind of make that did you make I that up i sure do will you share i will that? be happy to send Woo-hoo. that to you sure oh i love that that sounds great yeah that's, that's yeah. amazing and i love the cheddar swallow that drinks kind of like a red but kind of not it's such a cool wine exactly and i'm kind of interested in it because I'm planning a new presentation. And one of the things I want to do is serve some different wines that have higher content of sort of the heart healthy and generally healthy ingredients that we associate with wine. And most of them are in the reds, but the Cerasuolo is going to have a little extra kick of that because it has that different way that it's made. And that is made with 100% Montepulciano grapes from Abruzzo. And we actually talked to Enrico Cirulli about his Cerasuolo d'Abruzzo, and it's one of his favorite things to make as well. And he mentioned, and we didn't know this, and I've never been taught this about Montepulciano grapes, that they are almost in the tenturier category in, in that when you squeeze a bunch of Montepulciano grapes, they actually have red juice. So even though all the resveratrol and everything that you're saying is found in the skins, are you thinking that maybe there's some nutrition in the juice as well? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm thinking that, you know, just as the red color is there, probably from all the anthocyanin and different types of Mm -hmm. pigments. 
And those are some of the compounds that we think are responsible for many of the health benefits that have been associated with wine. That's exciting. And so speaking of red wines, we're going to move on to see what Steph's got in her glass up there. Jeff's got something red too, don't you? I do. I have something red in a giant glass in honor of hashtag Merlot Me Month. I'm having the 2012 Chateau Tumelan from the right bank of Bordeaux and specifically Canon Fronsac. And a special thank you needs to go out to Weekly Tasting because they did ship me four fun examples of Right Bank Bordeaux. And Val got the same fun wines and they highlight Merlot and Merlot's personality and the importance of it. So I am really enjoying this. I spent some time alone with it to really give it a chance to talk to me. Yeah. Uh Uh-oh. But you know, you don't have to be alone to enjoy this wine. You can also have it with friends friends have it with food all sorts of things but it's fleshy it's fun it's um layered with like vanilla cake and dark cherries maybe some dried cherries and then some cool older because it's 2012 there's some cool like rose almost like a dried rose i just loved the extra time i gave to like meditate on the wine nice nice wine and so what are you drinking val from our uh fun little sampling you know it's funny yes because steph and i did get the same box of goodness we can call it the happy juice box you want to call it whatever you want because it comes with the recipe cards and everything that i have right here in front of me so according to this card i am drinking the chateau tour du moulin which means the uh, windmill tower i believe Le Terre Rouge Fronsac, this is a 2014 stuff, and this one is actually 100% Merlot. I think yours is a blend, is that correct? Yeah, mine's Merlot and Cabernet Franc. Right. So the right bank is where Merlot and Cabernet Franc appear more in the wines of Bordeaux than, let's say, the Cabernet Cabernet. That's a new break for you. <laughs> the Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> Cabernet, the Cabernet Sauvignon focus left bank. So this is 100% Merlot. And I'm going to tell you ladies something. This is probably the first 100% Merlot wine I've opened in a long, long really? time. It's good, isn't yeah. it? It is really good. And you mentioned the meaty and the tannins yes. and anthocyanins. And, and those are present in the Merlot skins and, and that as well. So big shout out to Weekly Tastings because I love the opportunity to explore these new wines for hashtag Merlot Me Month. Now we want to kind of explore hashtag wine and hashtag health. And we're not going to do that throughout the whole show. But the reason we asked Matilda to be here is because she's giving some of these really informative presentations. And we we met her at the Society Wine Educators Conferences as well. And one of these questions, these burning wine questions that many wine people have, they're heavily contested, are regarding things like hangovers, headaches, and inflammation. So, Matilda, we want you to lay it on us. What are the myths? What are the facts? And what do people know about dealing with headaches, hangovers, and inflammation and wine? Well, they're kind of two separate topics, headaches, and then we'll tackle hangover and inflammation. But headaches are common. A lot of people have headaches when they drink wine. And it's important for people to sort of tease this out because a lot of times it's not just the wine that they're drinking that's giving them a headache. For example, they might be having a lot of different types of cheeses or perhaps sausage or other types of processed meats or fermented foods. And it's important for people who do tend to get headaches with wine to try to figure out what it is that might be triggering this. Is it always red wine? Is it always sparkling wine? Is it always when they eat? And also for women particularly, is it certain times that they get these headaches, like perhaps when they might have hormones fluctuating, because the more common causes of headaches are related to things like stress and not getting enough sleep and hormonal fluctuations. But wine uh, certainly and other types of alcohol-containing beverages are are in there as well. That's one important thing for people to try to figure out for themselves. 
But a lot of times we think that the headaches are caused by these natural chemicals that are in wines and they're called biogenic amines and not to make it a chemistry lecture, but these are chemicals that are formed during all phases of winemaking, starting in the vineyard, starting with the grapes themselves and with the soil, and then going through the fermentation processes and aging and the type of barrels that are used and how long. So they're very, very variable whether or not a certain wine will have a high content of these different chemicals called biogenic amines. Scientists have kind of looked at those as possibly being an important reason that people get headaches when they drink wine. And unfortunately, there's not an easy way for the consumer or the wine shopper to tell whether or not the wine that they're drinking is particularly high in biogenic amines. So there's kind of a challenge there for people to choose wines that are perhaps less likely to give them a headache. But there are certain things that up the amount of biogenic amine in wines, and that is like wines that undergo non-inoculated fermentations. In other words, it uses the native yeast, okay? And it doesn't use a specific type of yeast that's used to trigger the fermentation process. And then other things that tend to increase the biogenic amines is whether or not they're aged on the lees, for example, like champagne typically is and a lot of other wines. So those are a couple of things. So few countries actually test their wines for levels of biogenic amines, but there are a couple that do. So if I were sensitive to wines and got headaches all the time, I might look for wines that say did not undergo natural ferments, that were not aged on the lees, that tended not to have, say, prolonged oak aging, that were high in acidity, in other words, low in pH. And then I would look to South Africa because that's one of the countries that actually tests wine for biogenic amine content. That might be a way of stacking the deck in your favor, although I can't say that it's going to be perfect system, but that's one way at least to attack it. And I have a question about that too, because does that mean, like as you're suggesting South African wines, would you find it on the label what, that they've tested it? Or do you need to maybe look it up? Um, you know, if you're in a wine shop, are you looking it up on your phone and checking their website first? Or how do you go about finding that information? No, I'm pretty sure that it's countrywide that they require biogenic amine analysis in their products. Switzerland does too, but you know, we don't tend to get many wines from Switzerland here in the United States. And I believe Canada does as well. But again, we don't see a lot of Canadian wines here. I think for most of the wines that we would see imported from the countries that actually do require analysis, South Africa looks like your best bet. Yeah. I think just for my understanding, does that mean if they test it, if it's too high, it doesn't pass the test? Is that in the it would get rejected, correct. Right, it would get rejected. Okay, there you go. That makes sense. And then another question I had, just to be really clear on the natural yeasts and surly aging. So you're saying, even though that's, quote, natural, that those ways of fermentation using the yeast that's naturally out there, that can cause more biogenic amines in the wine. Correct. Those wines tend to have higher levels of biogenic okay. amines. But don't forget, these are not hard and fast rules. There's going to be a, a lot of variation. Some of the selected yeasts themselves may cause higher levels of biogenic amines. And the biogenic amines, they're generated, some of them in the alcoholic fermentation, and some of them in the malolactic fermentation. So that might be another way to avoid or at least experiment to see if wines that 
perhaps have not undergone malolactic, which as we know, most red wines do, but not all white wines do. That might be another way to see if you get a headache trigger from a wine that hasn't undergone malolactic. That's fascinating. Do you think there's more research going on with some of those? Oh, there is indeed, okay. particularly in Europe. But, you know, they tend to be ahead of us in some of these things, but it's on their radar and they are definitely looking at it. Now, in the food industry, you know, we do have regulations regarding some of these biogenic amines. So histamine, okay, people might not know the term biogenic amine, but histamine, tyramine, those are a couple of examples. So we have laws in effect in the United States, but they generally apply to seafood and seafood products, but they don't apply to alcoholic beverages at present. I wanted to just clarify one thing because I hear a lot of people in all the wine tastings I've done, they swear up and down. It's the red wines giving them headaches. We've seen so much on red wine headaches and hangovers. And a lot of people blame the sulfur. So before we move on to the next topic here, can you just put that sulfur thing where it needs to be once and for all? Because many people don't realize that more sulfur is used to make white wines for stabilization and to keep it from turning, oh, I don't know, brown. Exactly. And to preserve dried apricots. So yes, Absolutely, Val. I mean, I would love to put that to rest once and for all, but it's one of those myths that persists. A part of the reason is that there really are people who are sulfite intolerant. They're actually mm -hmm. allergic to it. That's only about 1% of people, though. Sure. And the allergic reaction is generally not that of headache. It's more a generalized allergic reaction where you have watery eyes, perhaps runny nose, sneezing, even people who have some problems breathing, a little bit of shortness of breath, palpitations, headache is generally not part of the symptom complex of people who are truly allergic to sulfites. But just like you say, sulfites are in higher concentrations in white wine and in much higher concentrations in many, many types of food. So if a person can eat a dried apricot, no problem chances are pretty low that they have a true sulfite allergy. But part of the problem with people believing this and not being able to shake this myth is that because it's on the labels, because it specifically states contains sulfites on the labels, people immediately equate that to bad. Even though they may hear that it's not sulfites, every time they see that warning label, there's an implication there that because they had to put a warning label on the bottle, it must be bad. But you are absolutely correct. In the overwhelming majority of cases, the headache has nothing to do with sulfites. And a lot of people will say, and I think, Steph, we might have mentioned mm -hmm. this before on the show, when you're in Europe, they'll get a bottle of wine and they'll be like, oh, there, there's no sulfite warning on the label. So the Italians don't put sulfites in their wines. That is false because they don't have to have that warning until they import it into our country. So a lot of times if you're buying a bottle over there or a case and you're sending it back, they'll actually scotch tape the sulfite warnings onto the label. I have <laughs> pictures of bottles that, that, that if that's wow. happened to. It's crazy. But I'm going to let Steph go on. She's got some questions for you, too. Yeah, and I want to make one more comment. I heard, I think it was at the recent Society Wine Educators Conference, uh, that there's a lot of sulfites in orange juice. I don't know if that's true or not. It would make sense that there is, but it also makes me curious, well, is there any sulfite labeling warning for orange <laughs> juice and, you know, and these dried apricots and things? It's like, that's maybe where... <laughs> where the fight should go. For some of us, it's like, well, let's get the warnings on all these other products then and see how we can get it changed. <laughs> well, that's just it. You put a label like that on there and, you know, it's very hard for people to think that everything is okay with that product that's, you know, been labeled that way. Yeah. 
It has to do with how many parts per million yeah. know stuff, right? The fact that it's natural doesn't mean it's not harmful. Yeah. Right. right. Because just like you said earlier, Val, in those European wines, I mean, sulfites are a natural part of the winemaking process. They're in the wine. <laughs> you know, that in Europe is not labeled as such, but they're there. And they're probably there in the orange juice. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Headaches, you know, I think we covered a lot of it, but you also have a headache when you have a hangover. And how is that different, the hangover experience? Yeah, it is different. The hangover experience is actually at least as complicated as the headache thing because we're still not quite sure how the headache thing evolves. But the hangover thing is, is a whole other story because you've got a lot of things going on. And much like headache is very individualized and people have their own individual triggers for these things, hangovers manifest in very individual ways. In other words, people know that for them, the worst part of the headache, uh, of the hangover rather, is the headache or it's the fatigue or it's the inability to concentrate or whatever, you know, everyone has like a specific type of hangover experience that they have. So the headache is complex. And we think that it's probably related to the fact that with hangover, your body kind of goes into inflammation overdrive. The headache results from this storm of inflammatory chemicals that's the most likely explanation for it right now. And that's why a lot of different types of hangover remedies have aspirin or aspirin relatives in the mix. Some of the best-selling ones and perhaps some of the most effective ones have a combination of water to address the dehydration issue and an anti-inflammatory like aspirin, and then a mild stimulant like caffeine to sort of get you going to overcome that hangover sluggishness and lack of energy. Part of it, the headache is more this storm of inflammatory chemicals that get released when it's been, your body has been assaulted by this toxic load of alcohol. So you get a hangover because you're over the limit. If someone were to check your blood alcohol concentration, it would be far over the legal driving limit of 0.08, okay? And it usually comes on 8 to 10 hours after your blood alcohol concentration has been really high. And interestingly enough, the hangover is worse when your blood alcohol has gone down to zero. Wow. So yeah, that's kind of the crazy thing about it, but it's your body dealing with the consequences of that alcohol being metabolized to zero. And that's a combination of the toxic byproducts of how alcohol is broken down and then compounded by the dehydration that's caused by alcohol having a diuretic effect and then releasing this inflammatory storm that your body is programmed to go through whenever your body is assaulted in some way, whether you cut yourself or stub your toe, whatever, your body responds by sending out this rush of different anti-inflammatory and inflammatory chemicals. Well, I think you addressed a lot of the good questions I had about biogenic amines, but I also wanted to find out how do congeners play into this, like when, with distilled spirits? I know we're mostly talking about wine and how people feel with wine, but I've heard some information too about, you know, dis- distilled spirits and specifically when they use the word congeners. Congeners just for the listeners, you know, are those wonderful chemicals as a result of the whole process of making the spirit or 
even the, you know, the wine, salt wine has congeners in it, but they're the flavor compounds and the color compounds. And some spirits are higher in congeners than others. The brown spirits, we call them, right? The bourbons and even tequila, which is not brown, but it ha it's very high in congeners. And then there are other spirits that are far lower, like vodka, even rum, I believe, is lower in congeners than, say, the, the other dark brown spirits, whiskey, etc. So yes, you know, Steph, you're raising the question, did they contribute? And the answer is, we think so. We're not positive, but there have been studies that have been done where they've actually tricked people, if you want to say, in, in control studies by using food coloring and stuff like that to see how people were affected depending on whether or not they were drinking a beverage that was high in congeners. And sure enough, the hangover frequency, in other words, how many people got hangovers or headaches after having congener high drinks compared to those who had drinks that were lower in congeners, the people who had the higher congener drinks did tend to not only complain of more hangover, but of worse severity of the hangover when they had higher congener drinks. So yes, there's something in these chemicals. We don't quite know what happens, but something in them trips our whole hangover mechanism or our headache mechanism, probably by some kind of interaction with serotonin and some other chemicals that are in our body that our body uses to communicate between cells, usually nerve cells, and that leads to headache. So they're all complex chemicals and every beverage has different amounts of different substances. So again, it makes it really tough for the consumer to try to pick out what's going to be least likely to cause a headache or give them a hangover. The best way to avoid the hangover, of course, is not to get your blood alcohol <laughs> level so high. That is the tried and true way to avoid hangover. And that should be that should be uh, something that we take very seriously after all. But congener is kind of like you know, my sort of workaround for people who get headaches is for people who are susceptible to things like whiskey and bourbon, they have bad effects from them is A, drink far less of them, but B, try some of the clear spirits or lower congener drinks and, and see if you, if there's any difference for you, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting too that tequila has high congeners and even if if it's a Blanco, you wonder what the congener difference is, you know, that kind of a, it's interesting how, yeah, how little I think the consumers know. And then how do you do your own personal investigation of how your body responds, you know? Yeah. And that is a tough one, but a lot of it can be avoided by just not drinking too much or drinking too fast or overwhelming your body, especially if you are of Asian or Ashkenazi Jewish heritage and ethnicity, because some ethnic groups ha have a higher proportion of certain mutations where they don't metabolize or break down alcohol as efficiently as other individuals. So the toxic breakdown products can accumulate and that results in that Asian flush or Asian glow if you've ever seen with friends or relatives when mm. as soon as they have a drink they're just beet red <laughs> and that's because they you know they can't go through the full breakdown process of the alcohol and it gets stuck and they have a toxic buildup of one to, one of the intermediate breakdown products. And I think you mentioned, actually, maybe it was Steph, you mentioned something earlier about how consumers, maybe we do lack a lot of knowledge about these things because the studies are so conflicting. But I think 
that's where we get to the well this study says red wine's good for you it's the same as going to the gym and this wine is not i think what's important for consumers to know and and maybe you can help us with this when you see these things come out that are retweeted without even clicking on them what is it people need to know about reading a study or reading who's sponsoring the study, or reading the peer-reviewed analysis of a study. What are the things we need to know when we see these things come out that that claim something, whether it's good or bad, about wine and health? Isn't that just crazy? But, you know, that's science for you. Science is not a straight line. And I can tell you, Val, that even for me, I mean, I'm not a statistician, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I've been around science for all of my adult life. And even for me, teasing through a lot of these studies is very difficult for not just me, a lot of scientists, because there's just so much that could possibly have made the study biased in one way or another. So I'm with you and I'm with consumers in in terms of having difficulty sorting through this. You know, there's there's not an easy answer to that. I go to a lot of sources when one of these big studies comes out because there are critics everywhere and on all sides and I try to make sense out of it. But I think a critical thing that the average person can do to sort out these studies is, number one, I see this every single day. There'll be an incredible headline that is almost too good to be true, you know, about some imminent cure for Alzheimer's disease or whatever. But as soon as you go look at the study, you realize it was done in rats and it's never been duplicated, and there's a lot of questions and a lot of caveats, but someone has taken these somewhat promising looking results and really dressed them up so that it sounds like the next greatest big thing. So that's the first thing, is to look and see, was this a study in rats (laughs) or mice? (laughs) That's number one, okay? Because a lot of times these headlines have absolute, they're so preliminary. They have absolutely no bearing on what we might get prescribed next week, okay? So that that's number one. But secondly, with a lot of these wine and health stories, what I think is really important is to see how well the investigators controlled. So in other words, you know, just a couple months ago, right around the time I gave my talk at the Society of Wine Educators, a huge study came out from over a hundred countries. It wasn't a new study, but it took studies from many, many sources. And that's wonderful, except that All they could basically control for was age, sex, and location. So they kind of took all this data from around the world and sort of averaged it up and came up with some conclusions that the authors felt should be the basis for government recommendations about alcohol. You know, there's a big problem with that because you look at studies that haven't really looked at who smoked, who didn't smoke, who had a high quality diet, who didn't, who was from a country that was mostly underdeveloped and had a lot of other socioeconomic problems and healthcare deficiencies, etc., and took those studies and just sort of averaged them in with other cultures uh, and other groups. So there are clearly some countries where binge drinking is just sort of the average style of drinking, pattern of drinking. And there are other countries that might have a high per capita alcohol intake, like for example, Italy or Sardinia, where the pattern of drinking is clearly not binge, where it's with meals, where it's 
slow, where there are societal norms that look down on binge drinking and becoming intoxicated. So I'm with you. It's like super hard to try to parse through all these studies. But one final point on that is I think it's important to look for studies that examine what we call overall mortality. In other words, not to look at, for example, as a lot of studies have recently, where they're looking at cancer, all right? They look at cancer, but did they look at that entire group of people who drank? And not only did they examine their pattern of drinking, but did they look at what we call total mortality. In other words, when they died and what they died of. So very few studies that have done this for cancer, for example, versus heart disease, in the very few studies that have examined this, they've actually shown that, yes, there seems to be a slightly increased risk of certain cancers with alcohol, particularly with heavy alcohol intake, but that overall the benefits that were derived from moderate, again, this is not to deal with the people who are drinking quite a bit, but the benefits derived from the moderate use of alcohol, drinking of alcohol, actually outweighed the risk of cancer so that the net was actually much more salutary, much better than what it would be if you just looked at cancer alone. But these are things that, like I said, are are tough for scientists. They've got to be tough for the average person. So what can I say? People, it's hard to develop scientific literacy and I think it it would just help if people understood that science is not a straight line of progress. It zigs and it zags, and what we're seeing are sort of snapshots, but it's going to unfold as a movie, and if you can just sort of stay for the movie, (laughs) you might, you know, catch the punchline at the end. Yeah. I think it goes with anything else we read. I always talk about media literacy, people who watch the news and just spout whatever they're hearing, that there's a certain amount of critical thinking that needs to be applied to anything we're reading. I don't care what it's about. Look at the source. How many sources were there? How current is it? How much credibility do people have? And really, you said all that thing. Who is the study on? How did they control the study? What are the populations and the universes of the sample subjects and everything? Like you said, we don't all have scientific literacy. We don't all have media literacy. But this is something that we probably need to learn how to do is just think critically and ask questions. Would you agree with that? I would agree. And there is a clear message that comes out of this, but maybe it's one that we don't want to face sometimes. And and that is a lot of these studies that seem to be so conflicting they are not conflicting about one thing, and that is that drinking a lot is just not good for you. Yeah, they all actually agree with that. So, we... <laughs> Okay, so that is like a message that people need to get yeah. because a lot of these studies don't control for the excessive drinkers or the binge drinkers. That binging is is really a big problem, including right here in the U.S. That that really accounts for the majority of our alcohol problems is, is the binging, as we're finding out in the political scenario right now, but also in life uh, in general, in terms of our health care costs associated with uh, alcohol use disorders and many other things. And I'd like to say one other thing, too, about some of these headlines that seem so over the top and promising and like, oh, this is the next, you know, big thing they've proven about wine or alcohol. When you read the study, a lot of times it's a study that proves that There needs to be more studies, and it's a study that says we had conflicting results, and yet the headline doesn't even really match with that. The headline is kind of something completely different, and people will retweet it or repost it on Facebook without really seeing that the study was inconclusive, but there was a very sensational headline. So I think that's the other tricky part, is that some of the studies 
even if they're well done, they're being on, they're telling you honestly, we didn't get any great results. But that's not what the headline says. Well, you know that that's very interesting. You bring that up for a couple reasons. They did a they did a study of that uh, a number of years ago. I thought it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is you know one of the top three medical journals in the country. And they tried to match the conclusion in the abstract, which is the abbreviated summary at the beginning of the article. They tried to match what was stated in the conclusion with what was actually found in the study, kind of what you're saying, Mm -hmm, Steph. mm -hmm. And they found that in a very high percentage, I can't remember quite what it was, but I thought it was in the neighborhood of about 20%, there was a mismatch between what was in the conclusion of the abstract, which, mind you, is what a lot of people read. They don't go read the whole 15-page article. They read the conclusion of the abstract because that's usually one or two sentences long. And that's a huge mismatch. So so that is one issue that is uh, has been a problem in medical publishing that's being addressed. Clearly, since that article came out, there was a lot more attention focused on it. But the other point that you raise about how they say that more studies need to be done and that there were some flaws in the study. That's just part of good article writing Mm -hmm. is that, you know, you can't presume because you did one study that you have found the answer. It has to be confirmed by other investigators in other people's hands, in other ethnicities, et cetera, et cetera. And then secondly, it's part of good article writing is to discuss the strengths and the weaknesses of your own study. You have to self-critique your own study. So you will see that in most well-done articles in the more prestigious journals. It's a, it's a self-critique process. And even though it sounds negative, It shouldn't be taken negatively, but it actually serves as a springboard for other investigators who might look at those weaknesses of the study and say, hmm, you know, they sound like they're on to something, but this indeed was a weakness. So let's design a study that gets around that weakness and fixes that problem and see what results we get. So it's actually quite helpful when authors do that. So that's something good to look for as well. And we won't get into p-hacking and all that other things that are going on. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Well, uh, I think we should move on if we still have time. I'd like to discuss a little bit about how recently there's been a surge in kind of a wellness movement in the hospitality and wine industry and the people who are really immersed heavily in their day-to-day with wine spirits and you know what what are you seeing out there and what's a good message that we can share with people about wellness and and some of the hot topics like natural wines or anything else that is there still need to be a lot of investigation in that or you know how do we stay kind of on the right course with wellness A lot of it is pure and simple marketing related. A lot of the connections that people are making between wine and wellness, you know, putting this health halo around wine. I showed a screen grab at my talk, Val, you might remember, uh, with a famous country singer who was saying, well, I just, I don't exercise, I just do wine, as though wine, you know, was an adequate substitute for exercise. Uh, Not. But yeah, so wine uh, gets this little bit of a health halo, healthification, if you will. And not always justified out here in California. It's a big thing at spas to have like wine and yoga where you have a yoga session that's interspersed with kind of like a wine tasting. And I can't say that that's my thing. And I don't really know that what that contributes to yoga. I mean, I think it 
detracts personally. That's my personal taste, but maybe for some people it makes it fun, kind of like this wine and painting thing that is such a big deal that I just couldn't imagine would be as popular as it is. But sure enough, it is. People like the fact that if they have a glass of wine, that their inhibitions might fall away enough to let them be a little bit more creative. I guess kind of like back in the, you know, uh, druggy uh, days when people thought that if they did LSD, they were better artists, or if they spoke pot, they were better guitarists, <laughs> or whatever it was. I, I don't, I don't think they're not connected. You know, I think they're kind of close. But as far as wine and wellness is concerned, in my book, is enjoying wine as part of a healthy lifestyle. That to me is really the wellness co- connection. And that means eating a high quality diet, not drinking to excess, getting regular exercise, having wonderful social structure, really, you know, being staying connected with people, not smoking and other types of things. So there's where you have some strong studies that if people actually did those things, which I hate to say, but less than 10% of Americans, it's actually closer to 5% of Americans meet the optimal parameters for those simple things like eating a high quality diet, getting regular exercise daily, blah, blah, blah. All those things. I mean, literally only about 5 to 10% at most of Americans fit all those things. And that has consistently been shown to be a survival benefit. That's one thing. And then as far as natural wine is concerned, I know we don't have a lot of time, but uh, natural wine, just like natural, a lot of stuff is, is not a regulated term. So people can basically use it the way they want it, but they're using it to describe wines that are made basically with minimal intervention, particularly in the winery. So you have fermentations that take place with native yeasts. There are no additives in the winemaking process added except for a little bit of sulfur before bottling. These are wines that are generally not clear. They're they're unfiltered, they're unfined. They generally don't use a lot of new oak. This It's basically this hands-off approach. So a lot of them use organic grapes or biodynamic viticulture, etc. I've had a number of uh, natural wines. I have yet to fall in love with one. That's just my personal preference. But a lot of people just think that they're quote, healthier. But actually, I don't see how that really is the case. In fact, I think a lot of them are outright kind of funky. <laughs> Barnyardy, they they don't tend to age very well. So I can understand that they want to have something that they think is more natural. But, you know, I, I enjoy wine for, you know, gustatory reasons as well. Yeah, the and pleasure of it. When right. I, yeah, and so when I meet some natural wines that I think are as delicious and as interesting as that Merlot that you were talking about at the top of the hour that was so intriguing and aromatic and complex, I mean, that's what I want in my wine. And just to circle back to where this all started, natural wines, you said, not necessarily are they healthier. There's no guarantee that they're going to contain less amounts of the biogenic amines that you mentioned earlier as well. Is that correct? That is correct. (laughs) There we go. Back where we started. I like it. Good point. Natural doesn't always mean healthy. No. Or good for you or not without health risks. A lot of people say, oh, let's have double the amount. So is opium. (laughs) Don't kill you. Right. So is opium. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, I just got a message on SpeakPipe from a listener. So this question is from Michael Schaefer. Hi, Dr. Parent. I enjoy both wine and spirits. And I do know that alcohol is alcohol is alcohol. Ethyl alcohol is the same in wine and spirits. Is wine better for me or for most people because of the reservatrol 
and the other chemicals compared to spirits or are spirits just as uh, beneficial as wine? Thank you very much. Appreciate your answer. Well, that's a great question from Michael. And it's an important one that we get all the time. And the short answer is, in general, it's the wine. They have compared wine versus beer versus spirits for a lot of different things, heart disease, diabetes, overall mortality, etc. Wine tends to come out ahead of spirits, and there's probably a lot of reasons for that. Number one being what wine is made of and the fact that it tends to have a lot of these health positive chemicals in them, the antioxidants, the anti-inflammatories. Michael mentions resveratrol. That's a whole other discussion. But it's not just that. It goes also to the pattern of drinking and the confounders. In other words, spirits just do not tend to be consumed the same way as wine. Wine tends to be consumed with food, slower. And yes, there's certainly binge wine drinking, but spirits are generally associated with not consuming them with food, not consuming them in moderation, not imbibing slowly, and often are coupled with cigarette smoking and other unhealthy behaviors. So has wine come out ahead because it's the wine or is it because of the wine drinker? Because the wine drinker tends to be a healthier person than the spirits drinker, tends to be better educated, have better health care, tend not to smoke, tend to exercise more, eat a better diet. So it's a matter of is it the wine or is it the wine drinker? So to Michael, question, I would ask myself those questions. You know, when I drink spirits, do I tend to consume them in a less healthy way than perhaps my consumption of wine? And look at it that way. As a physician, if one of your patients came to you and asked, what is a acceptable level of wine or spirits for me to enjoy during the week? What would your answer be? Thank you very much, doctor. I certainly am not going to be recommending, but what what do the guidelines say? So by American standards, our standards are a lot more liberal than the the UK, for example. Uh, And it depends how old you are. So there's a difference for men and women, but not if you're 65 and over. Then it goes to the level for women. So if you look at the USDA and some of these uh, United States Department of Agriculture and American Heart Association, etc., in general, the recommendation is no more than one glass, five ounces, 12% alcohol, seven of those drinks a week max, and not to have more than three in one day. But if you look at the World Health Organization, their recommendations are for less alcohol, less volume, less frequently, and they also make the stipulation that you should have two or three non-drinking days a week. And that's what you would tell your patients as a physician? Yeah, I would. Absolutely. You know, especially that part about no alcohol days, two or three days a week. That's important. Great. Thank you so much for entertaining those questions. Steph, did we get everything? I think we did. I think we got a lot of good information and uh, more than we asked for, which I appreciate. (laughs) I really appreciate. I mean, I kept asking so many questions because I find it so fascinating and I love your seminars. And uh, first, seminar of yours I think was in New Orleans mm-hmm. yes. and I, ju- I really like how you explain things so I just appreciate you being with us today thank you all right Steph are we ready for the embarrassing wine story 
Yes, take it away. Okay. All right, Matilda, we need to get your embarrassing wine story before we let you go. Oh, okay. I get to start. Okay. Well, my embarrassing wine story was a friend of mine who holds these wine dinners invited me to one of their wine dinners. So I was excited because I had, you know, had never been and I had heard a lot of great things about them. So I went and it was a blind tasting and he had, I think, 15 wines and he said there were 14 were pure varietals and one was a ringer but he didn't say what kind of ringer so I thought it was going to be like a Charles Shaw wine or something like that that was a ringer so I think I'm going to a wine dinner instead as he sort of gets things going he makes this huge introduction of me because I I had just won a blind tasting competition with a few hundred wine professionals like the month before and he went on about how I was some expert which I'm not a a blind tasting expert but just went on in this crazy effusive introduction and said that I would be introducing my impressions of each of the blind tasted wines So I was just like, oh my gosh, I thought I'm coming to a dinner and instead I'm on the hot seat. So the very first wine, all I could smell and taste was Syrah, which is like my desert island wine. I I just love Syrah. So of course I went on about how it had to be Syrah and blah, blah, blah after this big introduction. And, of course, the first wine was not Syrah. And it turned out that it was the Ringer wine. And the Ringer wine was a Southern Rhone GSM blend. Hey, you were close. I was close. I got, I got like, a, a partial credit, I guess, for it. But it was the very first wine of the night. And I had to go through the rest of, you know, do the... and. The, the only redeeming thing was that I got all the other wines right. Wow. But I started out, you know, because here you are, you go have this huge introduction and you flop on your first wine. So I was just mortified. But fortunately, by the end of the night, I was redeemed. But you don't want to start off behind on wine number one when you've been introduced as some ridiculous uh, golden palace. <laughs> wow, that's a great story. Again, props, because you were partially right, and anybody would have given you credit for that. So, yay. <laughs> yeah, and it sounds like you had a great recovery. So, I mean, that's impressive, because usually, you know, you, you have that anxiety of, I didn't get this first one right now. I'm going to probably screw up on all the rest. So it's like, well done, you know, well done, lady. <laughs> and we know you've got to go, but can you let us know real quick how everybody can get a hold of you online and social media if they've got further questions? Sure. I'm on Twitter at Wine Food Health, and my website is write as in write a letter, write on wines, plural, dot com. And then your book oh. is also on Amazon. So we will link that up as well. What's the name of your book again? Thank you. Yes, my book is called Healing Ways, an Integrative Health Source Book, and it puts together a lot of the evidence for different types of integrative healing methods, but specifically matches them up to health conditions. So if you have arthritis, should I think of acupuncture? Should I think of yoga? Should I think of supplements? So I kind of try to match up the evidence to the method and the condition. Thank you so much. I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this episode, but we know you've got stuff to get to. So we're going to go ahead and let you go. Thanks, Thanks. Val. Thanks, Steph. Have a great afternoon. So Steph, that was fun. Yes. 
so good and so well put and uh what a treat to have her yes and so we should probably move on to shout outs you think yeah shout outs let's do it we're gonna of course give a shout out to our sponsor who is weekly tasting for the wonderful wines that we had today each bottle was hand selected by experts to help us discover the new wines and learn and of course that will be the same for you and weekly tastings wine experts will do all the work so you don't have to yes Yeah, I love that. I love that part about it. And I'm trying new wines and I love that too. And you can go to your listener page at weeklytasting.com forward slash W25 to sign up, check it out, get started. And if you're like, you know what, I'll just go to the wine25.com website and click on the link there. Damn Skippy. Yeah, that's right. Damn Skippy. Get (laughs) Get her her done. done. (laughs) And uh, now on to our Patreon love. Yeah, we're going to start with our Reserva Superiority supporter, Robin from Girls Gone Grape, and our Reserva supporter, Auntie in Georgia, as well as our Tenacious Tasters, Jeff E. from the award-winning We Like Drinking podcast, Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours, Jen in Maryland, Dave and Lisa in Illinois, Anne Marie in Virginia, and Lynn of Savor the Harvest blog, and Sharon in Florida. And it's not five o'clock and we don't care, listeners. Meg in South Dakota, Clay in Arizona, John, Andrew, and Iswani, and Kristen in California, Chantel in Ontario, Canada, Mary Lou in Pennsylvania, Kathy in Georgia, Chris, Janet, and Diane in Colorado, Steve and Renee in Illinois, Kathy in Tennessee, Sean in Ohio, Ashley and Sarah in North Carolina. And our tastemaker listeners include David in Scotland, Carol in Kentucky, Karen in California, Chip and Katie in Pennsylvania, Serena in New York, Annie in Colorado, and Danielle. And for more information, you can go to wine2five.com, click on support to show your support and find out more details on how to support the Wine to Five podcast. And between our weekly episodes, you can find goodies on our website, wine25.com, or find us on the social spaces at wine. T-W-O-F-I-V-E. So until next week, where let's drink some more Merlot. Cheers, Val. Cheers, Steph. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine T-W-O-5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips.